Hey guys, I'm Michael Hutchins from Medano, and today I'm going to walk you through our multi-business unit content add-on so you can understand how to use it and customize it for whatever type of multi-business unit modeling you want to do. The best way to get started with the multi-business unit content is to look at an example model. Multi-business unit content is deceptively complex, so a lot of people play with it and think they can understand it straight away, but in actual fact, there's, there's a few things you really need to understand before diving in, particularly if you want to customize it. So if you go to the Medano tab, and you click on the open example models menu and you'll see that in here in the example models we've provided a few different multi-business unit examples we've got multi-business unit annual forecast chart of accounts one and that this really is a reference back to the generic financial modeling libraries so to understand those you really need to go online and look at the user guides under the resources section of the website and just go to the content user guides and you'll see the generic, generic financial modeling user guide explains the difference between the different chart of accounts. And the really big difference is really whether or not you're including cost of goods sold and inventory uh, and whether or not you're including detailed salaries and wages. Now, at the time of recording this video, uh, we have uh, multi-business unit content for chart of accounts one, uh, two, and five. We haven't done them for the chart of accounts that contain salaries and wages because they're quite complicated in how they deal with balance sheet impacts of salaries and wages like annual leave and long service leave provisions and payroll tax payable. So at the moment we've done one, two and five, um, but that should give you a good starting point for most multi-business unit modeling. So if you want to understand the core differences between the time series regions and sales taxes, go back to the generic financial modeling library, which is included within the basic Madano package uh, and look at that. And then you'll, you'll, you'll be able to move back into the multi-business unit, which is really another layer on top of those libraries. Now, the best place to start when you first start looking at the multi-business unit analysis is just start with a basic annual forecast model. And in this case, I'm just going to look at chart of accounts one with category links. So I'm going to explain the difference between category links and total links shortly, but just start by opening one of those examples, which in this case, I'm going to open the category links example. And you'll see that it's very, very similar to the generic financial modeling libraries content. So the dynamic templates that are available in the generic financial modeling libraries. Um, although you'll see that we have this business unit section and we've got a presentation output section that contains a whole lot of business units analysis. Now, before diving in and looking at how this all works, the best thing to do is actually have a go at playing with it. Okay, so if you look at this model I've got open here, this has got three business units in there, New York, Los Angeles, and Dallas, and it's got a business unit section with a sheet in here called business units. Now, the business unit sheet contains a summary of the business units that are already in this workbook, as well as a summary of the revenues and expenses categories. Now with chart of accounts one, we don't have cost of goods sold. So we've just got revenues and expenses. And if I go to any of the business units, you'll see that they all contain the same revenues and expenses categories. Now, if you don't want the revenues and expenses categories to be the same across all business units, you can actually delete this module um, and customize them, customize the categories for each business unit. But by default, we have this module in here, the business unit categories module, which aligns the business unit categories. And that means that if I add a category to any of these business units, like I add a new revenue category in here, it's going to add it to all of the business units. So I've now added that to New York. And if I go back now, it's actually added it to here. Information sessions and I've got say other events. And you'll see that's now added that across all three business units. So I've got New York, other events, and you'll see it's actually gone the whole way through say Los Angeles. And you'll see if I go to my financial statements, it's gone the whole way through all of those as other events for each of those. So it's pretty powerful stuff in that you can add categories really easily. now. You can also go into your business units and add a new business unit by right clicking, just clicking insert categories, and it will add a business unit above or below whichever category you've decided to add a category above or below. So I'm adding a new category below Dallas, and you'll see that if I go to my table of contents, that's added a new business unit down here, which I can then use the rename module tool to rename, say, Chicago. And then I can say, okay. I can then classify this, which I'll discuss in a sec. But if I go into Chicago and I'll put in, say, say 1,000 of revenues and I'll put in operating expenditure, I'm just going to put some random numbers in here. I can put that in there. And now I've got Chicago as a new business unit. And you'll see that's flowed through the entire model. So if I go to my financial statements, I've now got Chicago coming through. And if I go to my dashboard outputs, I've now got Chicago coming through my dashboard outputs. As I do my presentation outputs by business unit, I've got Chicago and also by region and growth potential. Now the, the region and growth potential are just classifications we've made up, which you can go to the time series sheet and you can actually change your classification. So we've called this region, you could call this like, you know, you know, type. You could call it whatever you like. And then if you went back, you'll see we've now got by type. 
and and the drop downs you've now got okay by by type. So we've we've in this example model we've put region and growth potential. But the most important thing to bear in mind is you can change those and you can also actually so growth potential you could add a new growth potential down here by doing insert categories and add a new growth potential say mega. And if you add a new growth potential, I can now go back and I've got in these guys, I've got say, let's put growth potential for Chicago as mega. And then if I go to my dashboard outputs here, I've got EBITDA by growth potential and we've got mega, which is, this is the forecast for Chicago coming through, which you can see that 4,000 is, if I look at business unit EBITDA is there because that's how I classify it. So the beauty of the business units, the multi-business unit content, is you can add modules or you can add, I should say, business units as easily as adding a new category to the business unit sheet. And then you can go in and add, add categories of revenues and expenses, change the number of time series periods as you can the generic financial model, and everything flows through the financial statements, the entire model, and flows through into the dashboard outputs. So in that regard, the multi-business unit content is, is multi-dimensional and is hugely powerful if you're modeling something like an aged care business or a, or a child care business or a franchise business where you have a growing number of stores or centers, for example, and you'd like to see a peer-by-peer -peer analysis of the different business units and enable the easy addition of those. So let's talk about customizing multi-business unit models because there are elements of the multi-business unit analysis which are much more complex than a standard single business unit generic financial model. And you need to bear those in mind. Now, the first thing to bear in mind is that the business units that are in a business unit model are mirrored. So in this case, if I go to my project manager, I've got in my project manager, you can see I've got a business unit section, a business units module area, and in that I have my New York, Los Angeles, Dallas, and Chicago. But what's really interesting about this is that they're mirrored intentionally. So you'll see if I go to New York and then I go to mirrored modules, so I go Medano, Mirror, Manage Mirrored Modules, you can see New York, Los Angeles, Dallas, and Chicago are all mirrored. And what that means is any changes to any of these modules are going to flow through to the other ones other than changes to assumptions. So if I went into New York and I typed in here, hello, and then put the made that say bold, and then I went in and put say a square around this box, you'll see that if I now go to my New York, I go to Los Angeles, that's now got that in there as well. So you'll see that the changes you make to any business unit that are non-assumptions based are going to flow through to all of them. And that's something important to bear in mind. So if you want one business unit to be different, you actually need to go to mirror, manage mirrored modules, and you need to unmirror whichever one you want to change independently. Okay, so bear that in mind before you dive in, because some people start customizing the first business unit and then come across to the second one and go, oh, wow, it's actually changed both of them. So bear in mind that fact, which most people want to leverage rather than actually change, um, but bear that in mind before you start customizing. Secondly, bear in mind that the, the actual content within the default dynamic template. So if I go to start a new business unit model and I go to a dynamic template and choose multi-business unit, the content within the multi-business unit dynamic templates is, is quite simple, is, is, is quite simple, and it's intentionally simple. So if I started with a model here, which just had annual forecasts and chart of accounts one, you'll see that this model is just going to have in it for each business unit, it's going to have just revenues and expenses. Now, the reason why that is the case is because it's designed to be customized. So we've got some people that customize customize these modules to do childcare, aged care, and they'll actually end up with, say, seven or 800 rows of drivers um, for each business unit. So, so, and that often you'll spend a week or two building the business unit, which will be a store or a center, and you'll do all the driver-based analysis, and then you'll actually spin that out across the model as you scale the model up to actually allow for maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 business units. And sometimes you may even need to split it out across multiple linked workbooks in a project if, if you've got a large number of business units. So you'll see, if you look at one of the other examples, in the system, if I go Medano open example models and I click on multi business unit model, monthly historical and forecast, chart of accounts five, including goods and services tax, this is an Australian based example, um, down to EBITDA for each business unit with category links, which I'll explain in a sec. You'll see if I open this one up, this model contains some customizations that have been made to the business units just to demonstrate how they work. So if I go into my business units and I go to Sydney, you'll see Sydney here we've got growth on prior year instead of just amounts. And that calculates the revenue. We've then got cost of goods sold because this is chart of accounts five. And with chart of accounts, we've got profit margin assumptions for cost of goods sold to work out a cost of goods sold. And then we've got growth on prior year. So you'll see all that we've done here is we've customized those three blocks that came in the default dynamic template. So 
to allow for growth rates, in this case, profit margins as, as assumptions, rather than just everything being entered as amounts. And that's something you need to bear in mind when you start building your model is, do you start with cost of goods sold or not? And then how do I customize my drivers for revenues and expenses? Because this is effectively the parchment you'll get given when you start with a dynamic template. Okay, now you'll note that when we go to actually open a new dynamic template for a multi-business unit model, that regardless of which chart of accounts you choose, the variants that are available to us, if I choose chart of accounts five and I open this, you'll see that if I choose, say, United States and I choose category links versus total links. Now, if I choose category links, which is what I've done before, you'll see the way the data flows with category links is if I open this one up, which is actually a category link example, you'll see down here that the data is flowing out as categories. So you'll see here that we've got product launches flowing out and salaries and wages. We've got these operating expenses all linking out and we've got the actual the headings that are actually linking out here are actually in column I in, 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 in light gray so they don't, they don't get in the way and cluster the page. But you'll see that what, actually, what this actually links out is categories of revenues and expenses. And what that means is when you go to your financial statements and you look at your, your income statement, for example, it's linked out the categories of revenues and expenses for each business unit. So you end up having this transparency. Now, if you don't want categories to link everywhere, you need to choose, you need to choose a total links variant. Now, if I go and choose a total links variant, I can go into open, I can go multi-business unit model, and here's an example here of total links, which is annual, annual forecast example, chart of accounts one down to EBITDA for business units, and I can do total links. Now, if I click on total links, you can see here if I go to each business unit and I click down below and I click and open up the new the summary, it's just linking out totals. And that means the heading that links out is just the business unit name. And if you go to the financial statements, you'll see the financial statements just link out the actual business unit names. So we've got the three business unit names coming through there. Now, this is the approach you would take if you had a large financial model which had say 50, 100 business units and you wanted to keep the model practical and usable because otherwise you're gonna have a huge amount of information on your financial statements. And, and it's not just your financial statements, that'll flow through into say working capital where you have your debtors and creditors. And you'll see here, working capital, we actually allocate our expenses, our, reven our revenue and expenses. And in this case, we're allocating totals. Now, it's kind, of, it's kind of a tough call sometimes because if you go into the, the category links and I look at my working capital here, my working capital is, is allocated for each business unit, uh, for each business unit for each category when I've got category links, which is really powerful because if you've got different types of sales, different types of products you're selling, you are gonna want different allocations for debtors and creditors. So what I tend to do is I'll generally choose category links by default. And if I'm, if I'm really struggling with the size of my model, I'll go into the financial statements and I'll actually remove these links, the category links, and manually, just by going in and just doing my precedent links pane, I will actually go in, show the precedent links pane, and I'll actually remove the category links and drag and drop in the total links instead. And that means you can effectively, if you've used the category-based business unit modules, you can effectively control whether the data you want to link out is category-based or total-based. But do bear in mind that if you've got a category-based business unit module, you are going to have all this data down here. So if your model starts getting up around 10, 15, 20 meg and starts taking five seconds to calculate, this is an obvious thing you can cut down on. It's always a question of whether you can do it without losing too much fun functionality. Now, where multi-business unit analysis can get really complicated is when you incorporate historical data. So if I look at an example model, I look at a proper example of a historical and forecast model which is the business unit model monthly historical and forecast chart of accounts five and i open that you'll see this is an example of a rolling monthly historical and forecast model so it's got the historical income statement and balance sheet analysis in there now in this model we've actually used category links for the different business units so if i go and look at the sydney business unit down here you'll see we have category links coming through so we're linking out categories of revenue cogs and operating expenditure and they're flowing into the financial statements and we've grouped them into subtotals so that when we add new business units, it will add new subtotals for each business unit we add. Okay, but the important thing to bear in mind here is that, that you need to collect your historical data by business unit, by category, if you take this approach. And this is one of the hardest things about historical and forecast business unit modeling is that normally the financial statements will be completely mixed and mashed. So you actually won't have this quality of data. And people often try and reverse engineer their model based on the quality of data they've got. The best advice I can give you in relation to this is get your data into, into a beautiful format to bring into the model before you actually bring it into the model. So for example, if your data is coming out of your accounting package, it's just a big munge of revenue and expenses and cogs, actually process it in a spreadsheet outside of your model and then bring it in. Now we often use VBA to do that and you can contact our support system and show you how to automate it using VBA because accounting packages do spit out data in a really logical format. 
so you can normally systemize it. But the absolute key to building an historical and forecast business unit model is working out what format you're going to be able to get your historical data in and then making sure you can automate the way in which you bring that into your model so that when the model rolls forward each month, when you have a planning model and you actually change the last historical period, when new data is available, you can actually update your model and it automatically brings in your business unit analysis so that your historical and forecast data flows through the model properly. Now, the final thing I wanted to note on the multi-business unit modules is just the presentation outputs. Now, the presentation outputs here, they're really pretty. The reason we've provided them really is just to provide an example of how you can create scalable content. So in the example I showed you before, um, you know, I added, I added a business unit. I added a business unit, Chicago, and you'll see that Chicago flowed through to the business unit dashboard. Now, you can customize these dashboards any way you like. We've just done some basic charts-based ones. You can put in, obviously, tables and do all sorts of things. But the beautiful thing about this, this dashboard module is we've actually put it in as a four-component module. So if you look at the, the, mo the project manager, the actual output dashboard we've put in here, which is under the outputs and other, is just the business units module, business units EBITDA module, and that contains the business units dashboard, the EBITDA by, EBITDA by business unit, EBITDA by classification A, and EBITDA by classification B. Now, we've called them classification A and classification B because in the background, we've, we've assumed here by typing into these cells that these are region and growth potential. But if you go into a dynamic template, such as this multi-business unit example here, you'll see that by default, they just come up as classification A and classification B, and that's where we've just gone and called them region and size. You can actually you can classify them any way you like, and you can add additional blocks of categories using that same approach. Um, they do use, it's worth noting, they do use global lists, which are a reasonably new functionality at, this, at the time I'm recording this video, and the global lists that we use there make it really easy for those those, those lists to, to, be, to be used in these modules, for example, without actually having to link in those lists every single time. But the beautiful thing about the dashboard outputs is that the dashboard outputs are scalable. So you can actually see the impact immediately of adding new business units. It will also reflect increases in time series periods and as you roll your model or extend it. So the dashboard outputs are really powerful in this system because when you end up having a situation where you've got, say, 20 or 30 different business units, you can start doing things like region-based analysis like we've done here. And you can actually show, show me my EBITDA by region, show me my EBITDA by, by growth potential. And you could obviously put anything you'd like in there. Like you could, put, you could put EBITDA by owned versus operated for childcare centers, for example, and show contributions. So the dashboard outputs are really, really powerful, but bear in mind they're a template for you to customize.